Um, good morning everybody anyway and welcome to what is the second Bridges Dialogue uh, hosted by Shrewsbury International School this year. Um, I'd like to begin by inviting um, our principal, Mr Stephen Holroyd, to the stage to introduce our guest speaker. Ladies and gentlemen and members of the school community, it gives me great pleasure in conjunction with the Peace Foundation Bridges Dialogue Towards Peace project to welcome Professor Sir Harry Croteau and his wife Margaret to Shrewsbury International School. Professor Croteau will be well known to all of you as an eminent scientist with that most renowned of academic awards, the Nobel Prize for Chemistry, as an honour of great world distinction. And I know that there will be many here this morning on the verge of undergraduate careers at the great science institutes of the world who will be excited and energised by his career and example in research and scientific discovery. However, Professor Croteau's interests range far beyond the confines of the laboratory, and he speaks out with passion and conviction to young people to encourage them to be courageous in exploring interests to their fullest, to making connections across disciplines, and to challenge conventional wisdoms. And it is therefore, with much anticipation, so I invite Professor Croto to speak to you all this morning. Okay, it's a pleasure to be here. And, uh, you can see I can't spell. It's a genius. And, uh, okay. I did that last night, so it's about 12 o'clock. So I'm sorry about that. But it's a pleasure to be here. I go to a lot of uh, countries, Japan, in Asia, in India, in China, and meet young people like you all over the place. Um, and I'm going to say a few words uh, about how I ended up in this mess, the Nobel Prize, which, uh, which uh, it is a mess. And I want to talk about, say a few things which perhaps you haven't heard before. A lot of, in America, they're very coming on leadership, right? And I think of leadership as being something different from what most people think of. It. And that is that a leader should actually teach you um, how you can think for yourself and lead yourself rather than being led by other people, okay, and uh, accepting what they do. And after all, what's the merit of leading a flock of sheep, okay? So the main thing is, uh, one thing here is that you don't want to be, I mean, sheep are nice, cuddly things, but they always follow one thing, and uh, we have some Canada geese, and there's obviously one guy who's the top, not, not. but if, I think in life you want to be creative and successful, and not necessarily making a lot of money, I hope, but it's necessarily what you all want, I think you have to be able to think for yourself, okay? Uh, I'll go on because it's part of another talk. I think the other aspect of being creative is that it involves what I call synthesis, that is you take two things and put them together and you get something new, okay? So that, and that can come not just from the sciences, I mean how are you, many of you interested in science? Put your hands up. How many are interested in art? Okay, okay, not good because I want you to put all your hands up for everything. Okay, because I was interested in music, art, science, uh, and graphics and books as well. And so let me give you an idea of synthesis. Uh, here's a field, you know what they are? What is it? Field of what? Yeah, it's wine. Okay. You take carbon dioxide, water, and you get a carbohydrate, and then you take the carbohydrate, and uh, with an enzyme, it's... Uh, oxidizes basically to alcohol and you have a glass of wine. So out of carbon dioxide and water, which is fizzy water, you can get a glass of wine, which I prefer to <laughs> fizzy water. So that's it, and that happens in grapes, and here I am enjoying <laughs> carbon dioxide and water, but it's been synthesized into something else, and that's what creativity is about. Now, the famous uh, scientist Pasteur said, in the fields of observation, chance favors only the prepared mind, okay? And he, just, he said something else, I'll add that now. Let me tell you the secret that has led me to my goal. 
My strength lies solely in my tenacity. He doesn't give up. Okay? So those are two aspects of this. I'm going to jump out of this. And I'm now going to talk to you about education, which is preparing your mind. This is what you're doing at the present time. And I wanted to point out that I used to be about your age. Believe it. I mean, I know it's not your age. I was. Anyway, and I'm, you're, you're all looking very beautiful and young now. But you're going to look old and decrepit. Right? <laughs> and so that's a problem. Uh, but you don't have to face that yet. Okay? So here is, I used to be called Kotashina. And this is, this is to my mother from school. And it said, Miss Barker thinks I had better write and tell you that we are not at all pleased with the way Harold, that's me, uh, has been working during the last few weeks. He, he is very fond of play. <laughs> and I still am. Okay, because play is what it's all about. That doesn't mean you're happy. It means you're playing with what you're doing. It has to be that sort of aspect of it. And in fact, uh, there I was. I was the only funny name in my country. Some of you are at Bennett, Chatterton, Entwistle, Fairhurst, Hargraves, Locks and Moor. These are all English names except for mine. So I, I was the sort of, I mean, I think in this class, if you have an English name, you'd be standing out in this particular class. So here it was. I didn't want to be a scientist. I didn't even know what a scientist was. What I really wanted to be was Superman. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, I'm going to show you the proof. That was... That was <laughs> so, basically, uh, yeah, I was a scrawny little kid, okay, like most of us were. So I had to do something else. I played tennis, okay, I did gymnastics, and I acted in a play, Henry V. I want to tell you something about how many of you like acting? Have you, do you act in a school play? Well, I'm going to blow this up. These two guys here. I'm the handsome guy on the right, by the way. <laughs> this guy decided he was playing Henry V, and he was very good at it, and he decided to become an actor. I decided to become a scientist in the end, and now he is 10,000 10, years old, <laughs> and I'm a young guy, right? <laughs> Fantastic actor in school. And here he was, he came out to Tallahassee in Florida, stayed with us for a few days, and he and I um, have kept in touch ever since we were in school. And uh, my, my meet told here he is at Florida State uh, working with the with the kids. That's what we do, okay? We both Ian and I go around to lots of places um, encouraging young people to be creative. It doesn't matter what it is, alright? It matters just to be creative. And that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about. At school, I, would, I did a lot of drawing, and I, I was fond of it. Initially, of airplanes, cars, uh, basically think, drawing things like this, I'm not sure. I, oh, I only got good for my car. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I drew Stockholm Town Hall when I was 13 years old, long before I knew what it was. Okay, so that's, I collected things, free, okay, brochures with beautiful artwork in it. All this was in custom. Magnificent. How many of you are interested in art okay? and do drawings? Isn't that, isn't that fantastic? For nothing. Okay? And I collected it when I was your age. Okay? Look at this. Amazing paintings, things of this nature. Uh, Swinging London. Well, I had to pay for that one. And, and beautiful <laughs> images of the sun. I think it's the most beautiful image of the sun I've ever seen. Okay? Fantastic. Okay? And here it is. Menus um, from art galleries. Postcards. Free postcards. Uh, funny ones like this, and, and cuttings from, that I thought were good from the newspaper. And cartoons as well. And some of you, how many of you know this cartoon? Calvin and Hobbes, okay? Then you'll win the Nobel Prize and get rich and go on talk shows, okay? And then he says, what about babes? When do we get bones? <laughs> <laughs> things that I love very much, and in fact, I hear lots of things that you do, which are part of your education for nothing. Explore everything that you can find about you. And I thought I'd show you how the camera. How many of you have taken a photograph? <laughs> With your mobile phone? Huh? <laughs> Alright, let me show you what it was it used to be really like, okay? I thought I'd show you this. Um, <laughs>
You had to do all that to get one photograph, okay? And basically, you had to get, have a very good reason to do it, okay? Yeah, it was all that, and uh, she's here in the audience now. Okay. All right. <laughs> anyway, to get a start so short, all you need to do today is put your phone And you don't know what's going on. I knew everything about it. I was learning. It wasn't that it was all about work. I was learning chemistry about optics and things of this nature. You understand what I'm saying? I knew my technology in a way that I don't know the technology today. And that's a big problem for you today, okay? So basically, that's the situation. And university is the best place to explore avenues of your creative potential. Now, you can do this online. But the most important thing in life is not doing things I said. It's working together with other people, the sciences, that sort of thing. I did graphics uh, I, when I was at Sheffield. I, helped, I didn't just do that coursework. I did brochures and posters and things of this nature. My first award was for this design, and it got into the newspaper. Yeah, I mean, you look like that, believe it or not. I used to have some hair. <laughs> there you go. And so, posters and things of this nature. So the main thing is to realize that in life, it's not just if you want to be a scientist, that you just do that, but you do other things as well. And my interest was in lots of things. In fact, here I designed some logos. I'm going to jump onto these logos here just to give you an idea. I did a workshop with young children, so six, seven, and eight year olds. I thought, I'm going to do a logo. And I was in the restaurant. So I took the serviette, I had a pencil, the biro, and I thought, well, I'll try to work out what a koala bear should look like. Ended up with this, and ended up with a logo of a on a, on a bucking ball. This is the molecule that we discovered, okay? And there it is, okay, including this one of an Australian. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me just jump on, and I thought I'd show you just recently, I've, um, I've done a, um, a stained glass window, and a book, and a, a book, book jacket, and various other things. And I'm just going to say something about science, which is not understood. And that is, big, oh, well, I'm going to jump on from that. Big, oh, 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 yeah, let me just tell you something. That science is one of those, if you go into it, is one of those most humanitarian sort of areas you can work with. Right? Let me show you what it was like to have an amputation in the 1780s. Yeah, I want you to look at this. All right? How many of you have been, had an anesthetic? Okay? You used to have to have an operation without an anesthetic. Yeah. There can be no more humanitarian contribution than anesthetics. That is chemistry to humanity. Okay. Not only that. Oh, I thought there was another one. Oh, 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 oh. Pencil. <coughs> no. Okay. This is a miracle. You don't have to pray. Okay. This works. 1942. <coughs> Penicillin became available. A year earlier, this little girl would have died. Within three weeks, she was cured. Yeah. Now, many of you might know there's a big problem, and that is that antibiotics are starting to lose their ability to cure these problems. We need young people like you to find new alternatives. We desperately need that because we probably are going back to this. This is a serious, serious issue. All right? And I want to show you what science has done. Okay? And here's one of the heroes of this. A guy called Healy, a Norman Healy, and no one's ever heard of him, but he was the guy who actually developed ways of building up penicillin. And that future is looking us in the face of the present time. In hospital, it's very, very difficult, okay? So, I'm going to go now to the last thing what I want to say before I leave here. I want to show you something uh, which is of particularly interest to school kids, and I like this particular cartoon very much. How many of you know who it is? What it is? Yeah? What's it? Snoopy. Yeah. Okay. Sally says, I got C in my coat hanger sculpture. Alright? I'm holding up this coat hanger. How can anyone get C in coat hanger sculpture? May I ask a question? Was I judged on the piece of sculpture itself? If so, is it not true that time alone can judge a work of art? Or was I judged on my talent? If so, is it why can I be judged over parts of life over which I have no control? <laughs> if I was judged on my effort, then I was judged unfairly, for I tried as hard as I could. Right. 
Was I judged on what I had learned about the project? If so, then were not you, my teacher, also being judged on your ability to transmit your knowledge to me? Are you willing to share it my <laughs> Perhaps I was being judged on the quality of the co-tanger itself out of which my creation was made. Now is this also not unfair? Am I to be judged by the quality of the coat hangers that are used by the dry cleaning establishment that returns our garment? Is that not the responsibility of my parents? Should they not share in my seat? The squeaky wheel gets the bricks on. However, what does she ask? She asks basically, how can anyone get seen in coat hangers? Okay, that's the question. Well, I'm going to show you. In 2010, we were on Piccadilly in London and went into the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition. Very famous. If you're in London in summer, go to Piccadilly, go into the Royal Academy. And this is the courtyard. There's a bus going out on the Piccadilly here. I'm on the inside taking home taking this photograph. And there, inside, was a coat hanger stock. Now, I agree. Can you see the coat hanger? Well, there's a small one. Okay? Right, now it is a coat hanger sculpture, and now I'm going to show you what it is. Twice the size of this person. Now that's a coat hanger sculpture. <laughs> I want to tell you something, I want you to remember it forever. Because when Sally asks, how did anyone get seen a coat hanger sculpture? Just look at the imagination. Huh? And you see that? The fantastic thing that they made out of coat hangers. And that is what you've got to do in the future. Okay? You've got to think, I've got a project, I'm going to have my own gorilla. Okay? So the main thing for you is basically attitude. Okay? And that is the fun, simple recipe for success. When you have an assignment, make sure you give it the best shot. Okay? If you're satisfied with second-rate effort, look for something else to do. That's what I did. I wasn't very good at the math and French. I found it very hard. But I focused on other things, okay, that I felt I had more passion for. My wife, Margaret, she loves French, and so she speaks French, and I don't have to do that now, I can just speak English. And it's not the teacher, it's you personally, okay? You've got to satisfy that you have done the best you possibly can. And if you do that, you'll invariably find you do better than somebody else, who's probably, maybe you think, smarter than you. Because I'm not as smart as any, I'm not smarter than anybody else here. I only have two things. One is that I do what I think I like doing better than other things, and I do it to the best of my ability, and I don't give up. Of course, you got to know you're at a brick wall, okay? But nevertheless, I very seldom give up. And if you do that, that's all you need. Okay? Thank you. And I'm now here for questions. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, everyone, have we got a question for Professor Croto, please? Any question based upon anything? Let's have a hand up. Uh, what made you change from your, obviously, uh, you had a lot of talent in graphics. How did you change from graphics into I science? I didn't choose that. I mean, I went to university, um, and when I was, it was just in the 50s, right? 58, I didn't think I could, I never even thought about it. I had, very, I had no careers advice at all. And so um, I think um, that was the thing. And I didn't ever even thought I could do something in art and graphics. And maybe I wouldn't have done. But anyway, uh, I had a, a very good teacher in chemistry. I was good at that. And he suggested I go to, because I was good at art and good at, at chemistry, he suggested I go to Sheffield University, which at the time was one of the top chemistry departments in the country, or anywhere in the world. And uh, George Porter became Nobel Prize, he was my professor there. Yeah. And, uh, and so I then went on, I had a great time at university, and someone else was there as well, so I had an incentive to stay and do a PhD uh, as well. And I was playing tennis for the university, and we, we had a very good tennis team. Um, we, we got to the final a couple of times, and we lost really because of me. I mean, in the sense that <laughs> it, it's actually true. I want to say that I, I, I don't play well under pressure. I mean, you know. Some Brits have been watching Murray versus Djokovic, and the, the great tennis players are those who, who perform well under pressure. You know, and that's only one out of ten uh, sports. Okay, under pressure is the thing. I, I, 
I wouldn't say I folded, but I didn't play well. When the pressure's on it, it's possible. It's in the mind, okay? So I don't, I don't, I avoid competition. I couldn't attend because it is competitive, but um, I just do what I'm interested in doing. Anyway, so I, I went to university, did chemistry, and then I wanted to say, I had a great time there. I was an art editor for the university magazine. I did the covers and, done, and, and drawings for it. And I did posters, and it was tremendous. And I won that uh, competition, Sunday Times competition. And I wanted to stay at university because it, I, I, it was such a great place to explore, not just science. So I did a PhD and then I was uh, offered a postdoc in Canada for two years and then I went offered a postdoc in the States for a year. And then I was asked to come back to the University of Sussex where a professor at Sheffield and Moon said, we want someone to set up a lab if you put someone in your way. So I just said, well, let's wait again more and then see how it goes for five years. If it doesn't work, I'm going to go to night school, get out of this, going to graphics. By that time, graphics was now something that I thought, you know, was moving forward. And today, you've got all these other opportunities, like uh, computer graphics and stuff like this. Uh, they've got the internet, and you can make your own films and stuff like that. So the media part is, is very interesting. And probably today, I wouldn't be a scientist, okay? Uh, because there are so many other options. Or maybe I would. I don't know. So it, it, it wasn't a big decision, it was going down the road, oh this looks like an interesting road, I can, I, I, I can find some, this, this sort of thing. And it's like when I go to a big new city, I go down these roads willy nilly again, and oh there's a bookshop down here and there's one down there, and I go to bookshops and stuff. Okay. Great, thank you. Alright, anyone who's uh, under the age of 202, yes. Okay, <laughs> sorry. And it's another thing about getting my age, you go deaf, so I'm going to get it. Hello, I'm Kamita, and um, I thank you for the talk. It was very, very thought-provoking, very fun. <laughs> um, I was just wondering if, if there, do you think there is a difference in the way people view, I don't know, people think, like in terms of creativity, if you are studying more arts or science perspective? Um, okay. I don't think there's much difference because it's hard work all the way. You have to, in the science, you have to be develop expertise in your area, and if you're an artist, you have to develop expertise in the way you're going to reproduce your, your painting and things of this nature. There isn't. There's only one major difference, I think, or the difference, and I, I thought about, about this a lot, and that is that in science, um, it's, you learn how the universe works. It's, it's, it's not the way you would like it to be. It's the way it is. And if you go into and become a research scientist, you go in every day of the week, and it's like going in there with Muhammad Ali, and he punches you on the nose and knocks you out in the first round, because you find it doesn't work. Okay? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you, you lose in the first round. And then on Friday, you get to the second round, something that works. Okay? And as time goes on, you get to the fourth and fifth round. Because the universe is the taskmaster. We're trying to work out what is true. Okay? For me, science is not just applications. As I talked to young people earlier today, um, it's, it's a lot deeper than that. Um, it's about the way it is. On the art side, when it comes to the fundamental aspect, it's the way you would like it to be. You have that freedom. But the actual technology of creating a painting, creating a sculpture, creating a film, then you have to know how it works, and you have to become an expert in the technique and technology. Okay? But uh, I think there is one thing I'd like to mention this about science, it's something that I mentioned earlier and we'll talk about later today. And I wanted to, to say this probably so that you understand what science actually is. And uh, I'm going to just say something which I consider this to be perhaps the most important aspect of what I've got to say today. So we understand what science is. One thing is what you learn here at school. Okay. Um, you learn and you, you're, you find out what has already been known. Okay, it's in the books. It's on Wikipedia. How many of you looked at Wikipedia? Okay, fantastic. It's one of the, I think it's probably the second great invention in education. The first being the printing. Okay? And why is that? Because half a million people are contributing altruistically, anonymously. They don't, their name isn't on there, to you. 
Isn't that fantastic that there are all these people giving their knowledge that they spent tens of years trying to understand to you? The second thing is the application. How many of you got a mobile phone? All right. Well, I got a mobile phone. I don't know the number. Nobody knows the number. I don't, I don't but I use it to wake me up in the morning. It's a very good one. <laughs> so it's the application of that knowledge. The lights in here, okay, the microphone, the computer. Those are all very important to you. But more important than that are the way that that knowledge has been dragged down to the universe, okay? The scientific method. How you, how you did find out what um, something that's new that no one ever knew before. And that's what you learn at university. You can't learn that on the internet. Okay? You have to do that in a PhD in the sciences. Or in, on other areas, to be creative yourself and develop that thing. And you don't do that by knowledge, you do that by in, being immersed in a, a research laboratory where creativity and things are being discovered. Okay? You watch your friend discovering something or not discovering, and being miserable all day and night. Okay? But there's something much more important. And before science had that name, it had another one. It was called natural philosophy. And I think it's very important to realize that because science is so useful, people think that the only use of science is to do something that's useful. And that's not right. It's a most important part of the intellectual process and the most important aspect by far is that natural philosophy is the only philosophical construct we have devised to determine truth with any degree of reliability. And I'm going to read it again. Natural philosophy, science is part of that, is the only philosophic, only philosophical construct we have devised to determine truth with any degree of reliability. And I'm going to rephrase that. I'm going to define it that the the philosophical construct that determines truth is natural philosophy. Anything that discovers what is true. That means it's got to be true here in Thailand, and it's got to be true in Japan, and it's got to be true in Brazil, and it's got to be true in Britain, and in America and everywhere else. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? It's got to be in, and it's got to be true on Mars, or on Jupiter, or on a, some planet in the other. That's true. Everything else has been constructed by human beings. Every, all our other things, our poetry, our sort of music, and all these things, these are not truth issues. They're very important, but they're not about truth. And therefore, as far as I'm concerned, one thing you should learn at school is and the ethical purpose of education should involve the teaching of young people like you how you can decide what you're being told is true. The teacher says, blah, blah, blah. Okay, teacher. How can I believe? Why should what is the evidence for what you're telling me? And teaching a skeptical, evidence-based assessment of all claims, without exception, is an intellectual integrity issue. And I will stand by that forever. That doesn't mean that what you would like it to be, what you believe on religious issues, on political issues, on social issues, another thing, may or may not be important to you personally, but it's not a truth issue. You understand? And therefore, it shouldn't have, none of these things should have authority because they're what individuals wish it would be. Okay? What you believe is not an issue for me, it's an issue for you, but not for others. And you could, must not impose those non truth issues. And so I say to you, that's a very important difference, and that's what science is, and it has that underlying, that doesn't, that the arts doesn't have. Okay. That has been the arts aren't important. And let me give you one issue of art that is very interesting, and I think you might be interested in, in this, and let me see whether I can find it. Um, I don't know whether I can. Maybe I'll move it out. Well, what a pity. Um, it's, it's difficult for me to find. Well, I'm not going to be able to. Read. But on the, that doesn't mean that you can't use the arts to discuss ethical issues. Okay? I mean, uh, Picasso painted the greatest painting of the 20th century. It's called Genica. 
Okay, do you know this painting? And therefore, you see that he tells you in that painting what he thinks about war. All right? I think it's a fantastic painting. Now, I'm not Picasso's greatest fan, but I think that painting is a great painting. And somehow, I thought I could find it very quickly, but I haven't been able to. But there you go. Thank okay, you. Okay, anybody else? Another question, please. Another one. Okay, let's go ahead. Uh, I see my name is Pam, and, and you seem to have a lot of interest in the arts. And I wonder how you, if you still keep those interests, and how do you combine them with your what you're doing now as a scientist? And I actually have another question. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Yeah. Um, I do a lot of graphic design. Okay. I do it all the time because people know this, and I thought I'd give you. Uh, let me just see what we've got here. Oh, this is the most recent. This is the most recent um, thing. I thought I'd like to. Show. Uh, we we have two sons. One of them makes films. and made a film with Ian McKellen, a short, very short, one day shoot. And the other one is a cartoonist. And, oh, I'll show you what his cartoon. How many of you contributed to the Jack the Dripper paintings? Jackson Pollock. Oh, the answer. Okay. All right. Well, the, one of the, one of them uh, one of them is a cartoonist, and I thought I'd show you his cartoon here. Uh, basically, this is uh, his presentation on, on on Jackson Pollock. Okay. That that is a Jackson Pollock painting, by the way. And uh, these are the guys that did it. Okay. Um, um, anyway, um, so they have a little little company, and I do logos. And I thought I'd show you this. This is the film that Ian did called The Egg Tricked as a Magician. And, uh, and this is a logo of a construction company. And this is how you do something, okay? Now, my name is Croto, and our, the, the film is Croto Film and Design, right? So I looked at this, and I, in the same book, because I got a lot of books of graphic art, I see what other people have done, okay? And it struck me, if, what I can do is do this. So I got the K. Okay, and I've got something like a pencil, and I can put that on there, so the film, and then I can actually do this, 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 and this, and then basically proto design. All right. Now that particular logo indicates how things happen. You look at what other people have done because you build on what is known. Science builds on what is known and then advances, right? in a way that nothing else does, and this die line. Okay, so there's the K, and I bring these together and synthesize out of different ideas something new. You get the idea? So that's the sort of graphics that I'm involved with. And also, I think we've, we've actually, um, let me just see whether I can find this. Um, oh yeah, um, here is um, a book. This is a, um, these characters were created by our younger son, and I put together a book for these, and so a little boy that gets smaller and smaller. I mean, it's in Japan, and here is this little book teaching kids sliding down DNA and then being discovered. And, uh, powers of 10. So, yeah, it's still good. Keep going. It means I work until 3 o'clock in the morning. But you're young. Thank you. Here's a scene. I'm Cindy. Um, first, I'd like to echo what Kanita said earlier and just say thank you for a wonderful presentation and everything. Um, I read on um, a website, uh, like he wrote a biography, and one of the sentences that caught, really caught my eye was that if the decline in hands-on science education is not redressed, I doubt that we shall survive the 21st century. And um, so my question is, um, how would you improve upon the education today in both the sciences and the arts? Well, um, I, I'm actually using young people like you to improve education. Um, let me see if I can solve this problem. Um, we are now working on a project called a GSS, okay? And um, if I can find this here. Um, Yeah. And uh, I've been encouraging um, your headmaster to think about this. We have a computer 
and we have video, so I can I go around the world to India three weeks ago. I didn't go there, I went by internet, and uh, basically we use this sort of technology. Now, uh, we have students, um, I should just check whether this works okay, um, and uh, let me just stop it there, because I might be able to solve this problem. Um, this is an indication of always be uh, ready for everything, okay? Be, and so, let's see whether I can put these on here, just in case. I haven't thought about this because um, we always come prepared. And what we're doing now is getting young people like you to help. All right? So here is uh, one of our presentations. Should... Here are the Beatles. George, John, Ringo, Paul. We all know the music, and most of us even know of oh, their path in the world today. However, whether they realize it or not, We've had more contact with another type of beetle, has felt that they have far more influence on our daily lives. Not about these beetles, the insects. And this presentation will be all about the wonderful world of beetles. So why talk about bugs? They seem so insignificant and so unimportant. Well, first of all, the study of insects is an extensive branch of modern biological research. Good stuff, we're just going to jump on, okay? Stop it there. Well, our contribution now is to get you young people to contribute to the education of other young people in other parts of the world. But there's a spin-off for you. We're going to what's called Wikipedia Mark II. And we got a school, just one month ago, a school in Yokohama, a Japanese school, the first presentation by young people like you came in. And also one in Alabama came in two months ago. So I'm hoping this school will now do this, but there's an advantage for you, okay? And I'll show you what it is. We get out of this. I have not really time for this, so you need to, but you should look at um, the site, which I'll give you in a minute, and let me get out of there. I want to show you what the advantage is for your teachers. Whoop, sorry about that. Click on that, bring this down, so the teachers can actually see this. All my students, they have to do, when my courses have to do a project. And your teachers have seen a pile of paper like this, have you not? Yes, okay, and that's a headache. It's, <laughs> it's Sunday morning, and you've got to get these damn things marked for Monday. But here I am, in England, <laughs> drinking a glass of wine, watching my students making a presentation. And this has massive advantage, because I see what you're interested in, how you present it, and what's more, we found that when you do these projects, your enthusiasm for doing a good job really goes up. Secondly, this is the thing that we need to think of. And this is coming. This is inevitable. This is what you write. How many of you have written a resume or a CV? Okay. How long did you spend on it? Hours? Writing all these words. And I've got to spend hours reading this thing, right? And saying, but basically, Kerry. He's one of the students, I'm going to show you in a minute. He's on top of the pile, okay? Because, I'll just show you his presentation, which is shown here, okay? He's a graduate student. Hi, my name is Terry Gilmore, and I'm a graduate student here at Florida State University. I work for Dr. Al Bogan as an organic chemist. Now, I love organic chemistry because it provides the opportunity to go through and be an architect, an engineer, I love organic chemistry, right? That's what I want to hear. I want someone to come out and say, right, I really do love what I'm doing, okay? It makes me not just a chemist, but an architect, an engineer. He's thinking about the wider aspects. He's building things more as people build buildings, okay? And then he goes on. I think I'll just move it on to, if I can just bring this over here, to about, um, let's see, whoops. Small and close it up, we can extend that all the way through and form a much more. 
I've got to jump out there. Now then, this is the re reason I'm going, because I have got evidence, that's what it is. So we want to know, does it work? Well, let's have a look at what these guys are doing, okay? Hall of Fame. Kerry got a Fulbright scholarship to Italy, okay? We sent the URL and his, his non application support. Steve Apple, who was working with me, put together a fantastic little movie of what we're doing. We got a, a, an educational award. This is interesting. Prajna was an Indian student in the next office, and the first student that I recorded, and she got four tenure track professorship offers, and she's now in charge of an educational project, she said, because the uh, head of the department saw her presentation and saw she's the teacher and she's the sort of person she wants it. It will follow you around. Brittany got into medical school and she said the presentation was the defining factor in getting into medical school. He said, I, I, it was fun to do it and it helped me, I think, get my position. Our trees, one of my students, when she went down for interview, walked in, the first thing they said, we saw you on the internet and we enjoyed your presentation. Imagine you go on for an interview, your first interview, and they say to you, suddenly you feel relaxed and you've done the thing. Jennifer got into vet school. Uh, Daniel just got a Goldwater Scholarship, the highest uh, science award for undergraduates. Noriyuki and our Japanese know have got a job at NHK, the TV company, and this is the one you need to look at. Saino is a postdoc in Japan from India, and she sent the URL of her presentation to the Mahatma Gandhi University, and they liked what they saw, and she's now uh, got a job as an assistant professor there. And my colleague, um, Mark Riley, sent these up to NSF, and they can see it. So when you do this, you can send it to whoever's giving you money. And you say, these are the students, they, the, the people who are supporting this school can look at the students and say, yeah, and you, they don't have to read. They can just look at them and drink their glass of gin and tonic at the same time. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, we've got another question, please. Yes, please. Oh, gosh, yeah. Hello, Professor Crotto. Thank you for being here. I'm Mary Conger, and I have the privilege of being one of the careers advisors here. Um, given that you have experience teaching and learning across uh, Canadian, American, British systems, and you're advising our students to sort of think in an integrated way, be creative, explore their passions, what advice or comment do you have for them about how to begin thinking about what the right school or even just system might be for them? What do they look for? I, I, I don't really have very much advice because I just, I've been very fortunate of always being able to do what I personally want to do. And so the things that I'm passionate about, I've been able to do. I've never, you know, I've never had to teach really thermodynamics. <laughs> if you're a chemist, you'll know what I mean. Although it's a very interesting subject, I never felt comfortable because it, the classical thermodynamics is sort of the 19th century era. I was a, I'm a quantum guy, quantum mechanics, so statistical mechanics was. So I was very lucky to, to always be able to do what I personally was interested in. And I think one problem with the educational process throughout the world, particularly in the USA, is that there's a committee that decides this is what you have to know. I don't think they have to know something. But what the teacher has to do is somehow uh, create a, a, a sort of classroom uh, impression that they really are passionate about what they're doing. And I, I was fortunate to be in a very good school, and I think this is, where I had the freedom to, and, uh, of, where the teacher had the freedom to just do the things that they were interested in doing and not have to teach things that they didn't want to teach. That's a problem. Um, but at a university, I was always able to do my fields, like in spectroscopy. And I found that for, I'm a, that's a chemical physics area, quantum mechanics. And it turned out that we discovered um, molecules in space. And that turned out to be a tremendous um, hook. Because everybody likes space and stars and planets and what, interstellar stuff and things of this nature. And I found that that was a major hook to get kids interested in so they learn some quantum mechanics, which you need to understand the signals that come in by light, by the radiation around the space. So um, every teacher is different. I'm different from others. Every child is different. And so, and as I say, the, the main thing is, is how do you encourage an individual kid 
to do what they were good at. And I was fortunate to have two teachers, one who recognized that I was good at chemistry. And he um, became a professor. He left the school, actually, and then became a professor of organic chemistry. And he was passionate about a molecule called benzoin. And I got the same passion. It turns out on my finals paper, four years later, I, I just, one of my best answers was something I learned at school from him, extra to what was on the thing. The second thing also in life now, I was drawing these things. And it turned out that architecture was very important in my science and chemistry. Uh, so the, the encouragement I had from a teacher, an artist who gave me extra art lessons at, at, at lunchtime. And I think that's it. Uh, and of course, if you take a class of 20, 30 kids, you know, so there weren't that many. I was very fortunate in a very small class. Um, then all the kids are not going to empathize with French. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I came 31st out of 33 in French one year. And my dad was so pissed off, he gave me a, 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 French, a big French dictionary for my birthday. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I didn't, it wasn't any good for my French, really, but I mean, I didn't come so low. So that's the sort of pressure I had, you know, okay, I'm not going to, you know, if you want another French dictionary, you better go, or you don't want another French dictionary, you better do better next year. But that didn't really make I was passionate about it. So I think, it needs, in teaching, for the teacher to look at what are the individual good at and encourage that. And if it turns out you have a passion in that area, it's very easy. And then hopefully in another class, the kids will empathize with another teacher. And it's not possible to do it any other way. Um, but uh, I don't think there's any point teaching yourself you're not passionate about. But that's a problem because some big committee says you've got to know this, that, and the other. And that's not you have to know something, but I think hands-on, which is what you're talking about, okay, is, is there another little kid you can see, I mean, this is, I, I think this, this picture for me epitomizes everything about teaching. Look at this kid, totally absorbed in what we're doing, and uh, I realize he's smarter than I am, I can see that on my face, okay, I just love this picture, Margaret took it because she's, you know, this is, she's, she's the cameraman uh, now. Um, and uh, that's what it's about. Individuals finding what they are. I, I, and, uh, there's no difference between kids here, in Japan, in China, uh, America, and the UK. I do workshops with six and seven year olds. I mean, I've done uh, workshops all over the world with uh, Manchester United footballers. They're all the same. Um, it's just later with the problem. Thank you very much. Have we got any more questions, please? Another question. Oh, thank you very much. Hi, um, my name is May. And to love from what you said that we should do, um, like carry on on what we like, wouldn't there be any disadvantages if you have, if you're giving up on like something that you don't have passion at all, but you have ability to do it? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, let me tell you something. I've got tinnitus. Anyone know what that is? It's a, you, have you got it too? Yeah. Um, and I'm going deaf. I'm going old. Okay. Did anyone did you, did you just catch it? Okay. Wouldn't there be any disadvantages by like concentrating on only what you like? Is it disadvantageous to concentrate on just what you like? Okay. I, I, I was conscious when I was at school that I wanted to... You see, all, I, I, my, my parents were refugees. From, from Germany, okay, um, in 1937. And I was born in 39. And my father didn't play soccer. And all the other kids could play soccer, okay? But I wanted to do something. Uh, I wanted that, that I could, you know, I, I, there was no way, I, I was pretty good at soccer, but I wasn't gonna get into the first team. It was because they'd all played it a lot more. So what did I do? I thought, gymnastics. So I did that. So I wanted to do a sport. And the other thing is, um, I wanted to, uh, oh yeah, I wanted to play a musical instrument, all right, and she, she's there too. <laughs> 
And so when I got to university, I, I learned how to play the guitar. And that was good because in the 60s, if you couldn't play a guitar, you wouldn't get invited to parties and meet girls, right? Or girls be boys. And so it was a good incentive. So we used to have these parties and on Saturday nights, right? And everybody had to play a couple of gigs, right? And so I did that. And, um, and the answer is yes. Because life is not just about being focused on what it is. So I thought, well, I'm gonna, I, I would like to do a sport and be good at it. And in fact, my sport was tennis. I, I later played tennis. And we got to the finals in year and year. Um, and as I said, that um, I, we had a fantastic team. And uh, even though I knew that under a lot of pressure, I, I didn't quite have the, what it takes. Because sport is something in the head as well, you know? So when you go to university, and at school too, just dive in because you don't know whether you like something unless you dive into it, right? And, and, and so if your friend is doing something, and in fact, so I got to the university, a good friend of mine could play the guitar, and he taught me how to play with, you know, and I just worked at it for a month. And after a month, I could play one tune, you know? Now, of course, my fingers got struck and stuck in the string, so that's a bit of a problem because I don't do enough practice. It's absolutely vital, and in fact, the molecule that we discovered which is here, this molecule, if you look at it, uh, oops, you'll have better get out of this and find uh, one that really, uh, okay, this one maybe works. Um, this is the molecule we discovered, and this is an architectural structure, okay? And it turns out that um, basically, um, Oh yeah, I used to subscribe to a magazine called Graphis. This is this magazine still goes, and I've got 200 issues. It's called Graphis. It's, it's the the sort of journal of graphic art. Okay, that's the cover of 103, the first one. That's 160. This is number 92, and so on. And it's got images like this of, of graphics, Elton John. Uh, here's on. Um, cartoons and graphic novels, things of this nature. And the major one is this one, Graphics 132, Expo 67, where we went. And it's, uh, the major image in this book is this. Now, this molecule, this structure is uh, about Mr. Fuller's dome. You see all these, do you see this? Hexagons, six membered rings. Can you see that at the back, okay? Well, you know, do you see this? This is the geodesic. And there's one pentagon right there. That's the, all these are hexagons. And I don't know, but there's a pentagon. You can just about see it there. On this picture, everything are hexagons except the pentagon, which is right there. Now, if we go out of this, okay, and that picture was the, the one that was a clue to the structure of the molecule, this one. And you'll see there's a pentagon there, and it has the same structure as a soccer ball. And so there's a, the reason that I'm standing here today, and you think I'm a smart guy, because these guys in Stockholm thought it was smart, is because one of the clues to what the structure would be was in this um, magazine. And so let me get to that question that I went to at the beginning, which is from Pasteur. If we go back to this, okay, uh, which is here. In the fields of observation, chance favors only the prepared mind. The answer is, you've got to have a very wide, interesting number of subjects. Because they all come in. They have to be interested in society. If you want to do a humanitarian contribution, you have to think, what, what ability do I have that I can make a contribution? Yes, what do I say? If you want to think, I'm interested in finding an alternative to antibiotics. Okay? That would be a humanitarian contribution. But we don't know. You need to have a wide interest in books and other things. Architecture is also, is that, as Kerry said, it allows me to be an architect when I'm in synthetic chemistry. He actually thinks of it in terms of structures like that. Thank so, you. yes, as broad as possible.
Thank you. Uh, one more question before we finish for today, please. Um, at the beginning of the slide, you said um, if teacher unlocks creativity, creativity, and I'd like to know what our students can do if if somehow teachers lost creativity and <laughs> we weren't allowed to do what. Are you telling me that teachers? <laughs>